Hey gang, in this video I'm going to break down the second Childish Jape single from the new album called Another Dose. Sounds like this, it's funky, it's syncopated. I want to make sure we get counted in right though because this is one of those grooves that if you hear it off you can hear the, the measure displaced easily and then it's really hard to hear it back. So what's going to happen, <laughs> I'm going to count it in, it's going to go one, two, three, four, one and two, ga, to get the boom, boom, ga. The first snare drum is on the end of two. And this is one of the main things we're going to talk about. There's two displaced snare drums in this main groove. So there's really no two and four backbeat. But it's basically a funk song, and I think it grooves. So it's interesting that, that we can actually remove that two and four element that seems so crucial to the groove and still make a groove. So anyways, that's what it's going to sound like. One and two and. Took it to boom, boom, two and. Took it to boom, boom, two, got get the boom boom got right and so this is the groove that we're going to focus on most of this video but we'll talk about the whole song so this is another dose by childish japes here we go Okay, so let's dive into this. A couple very broad musical considerations before we start talking about the beat is the first question we're often thinking about and asking is what tones does this song need? So this song started as a, a song seed, I call them. So me just recording beats as voice memos in my phone, sending them to the guys, Asher and Jed, my bandmates. And in this one, Asher sent back this super upbeaty, syncopated line that you hear. It's actually all upbeats. You need a three, you need a four, you need a one, you need a e, 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 e. Those are all E's and S. Four, you need a one, E, A, E, A, E, A, E, A, E, two, three, four. And it goes over the bar line. So it starts after beat one. One E, A, E, A, E, A, E, A, one E. So we get the, starts on the E, all the way to the next E. So you essentially have a full measure of eighth notes displaced to the upbeat. Um, but he's obviously playing super tight, uh, short notes. And drum-wise, uh, I hadn't had a big vision musically in mind for this beyond the groove, but when he sent that, it became clear that what we need is tight drum sounds. So as far as the tones that we're thinking about, right, this is the snare drum I used on the recording. It's an old 13 by 3 PDP steel piccolo snare. It sounds super cracky and tight. It's very muffled. Hi-hats that are tight. Um, and then what we would do in the studio is actually move those toms over there. But if I were going to record, like right now, I would put cloths on these to kill the ring because when I hit the kick drum you actually hear the toms go because I have them tuned pretty openly right now and the overheads and the crotch mic which is pointed well you can guess in here um, picks up that sound but we want it to be super tight so if you listen really closely like with really detailed speakers or headphones to this uh, this groove you don't hear like a kit resonating with the groove and that's very intentional sometimes you want that. I like that sound a lot for my playing generally, but it's just not the vibe. So if we could start by thinking about the sounds that we're going to use, we can get the kit kind of rocking. And then also, uh, I mean, this just should be said all, off the bat, everyone needs a sort of like standard crash sound. <laughs> it's very fashionable to have very dry, very short sounding cymbals. Um, they look really good. They sound really good. But a lot of times they get lost in the mix when it's like a really powerful funk tune and then the energy needs to be there. So get yourself a shimmery, medium thickness, you know, 18 or 19 inch crash. This is the Byzance brilliant 18 inch thin crash. It's the perfect crash. It's like the crash in my mind. If there's an archetypal crash sound, this creates it. And this is the kind of song that you'll hear really benefits from having it, right? I don't need like an artistic kind of interesting color. I need a crash. <laughs> so, got the crash. Um, and other than that, let's think. Yeah, we'll think more about the actual way that the, 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 un the fact that Asher sent this guitar part back to this beat 
is really interesting to think about, actually, because of how these rhythms do and don't correspond with each other. But we'll talk about that after. First, let's jump into this beat and uh, learn it and learn why it's a little bit interesting. Here we go. Let's hear it one more time, and then we're going to think through it uh, one, one element at a time. Let's take this element, or sorry, this groove one element at a time. And this is a useful way to think about what's happening with this groove or any groove is to start with standard groove rules. And of course there are no rules, but what I mean by this is that sort of your, your typical, your quintessential groove following the rules is your right hand is keeping time, your left hand is playing backbeats and ghost notes, and your kick drum is playing the melody of the groove basically. So if we take that as a starting place, right, and you know, if I'm playing a sort of regular groove according to those rules, it sounds like... A version of playing along to this song that follows those rules would actually sound like, I have the drumless track here, what if I just play a sort of two and four version of this? What would it sound like? One, two, here we go. Your story that nobody noticed. Bitching your laughter. More than a pause, but less than an answer. It's something that matters. The actual beat. I know that nobody's perfect. Now you're making me feel like an inconvenience. And all that's gone to pieces. Now we don't speak much about it. So, those are, you can see how they're related. Right? Um, um, we can see that there are steps removed from the first one to the second one, but there's kind of a lesson built in even here, in that a lot of times when you're presented with a guitar part or a rhythm part or a bass line or something, you kind of play what comes to you first. And what I hope this lesson inspires in your own creative composing on the drums is to accept that starting place as a great starting place, but see it as a starting place, and then start to ask questions. Right? What can we do with the hi-hat? What are my options with backbeats? What are my options with ghost notes? What are my options with the kick drum? Could the melody that everyone's playing be somewhere other than the kick drum? Could it be passed around between different notes on the kit? These are all things that are involved in this groove specifically, but they're also all creative questions you can ask yourself to get yourself past that first initial and potentially sort of boring idea that you have. And that's how it works for me too. It's like someone plays something and I go, okay, doom cat, ba doom bukat, boom, bukat. That would work. That would work. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's the best option. So here's some ideas for taking it further. Let's start with the hi-hat, because the hi-hat's doing the least interesting thing here. And something needs to just kind of be straightforward. The, the, the right hand on the hi-hat is basically being a metronome. It's basically keeping its traditional role of keep time. In this case, it's playing quarter notes. Nothing interesting there, but what becomes interesting is when we open the hi-hat, it introduces us to the placement of the snare drum here. So you'll hear in the beginning of the song, there's an open hi-hat on beat two, one and, where there's usually a backbeat, one and, one and, two and, and then you get to that snare drum, one, two and. So the hi-hat closes between, not with the hand, but between. And then you play a snare drum with that closed hi-hat.
Okay, so with the hi-hat, Miss playing quarter notes, we have an open bark on beat two. And this introduces us to the real sort of meat and potatoes of this lesson, which is the displaced backbeats. So a backbeat, as you know, is usually on two and four, and this anchors the groove in a major way. Right? The kick drum can do a lot of fancy stuff. Sometimes the hi-hat will do some fancy stuff. And a lot of times the backbeat is what establishes, continues to establish the time in the most consistent way. So when I say, when I use the term alternate backbeat, the important thing is that even though it's in a different placement, it serves that same purpose, aka it's repeated and continues to appear in the same place. If I'm just placing snare accents randomly in the measure, that doesn't serve the purpose of anchoring anything and uh, sort of marking the time, the bigger time. So that's not an alternate backbeat. But in this case, I'm always playing backbeats on the and of two and the E of four. And they're always there. So that's why, since they keep repeating, and they're close to where the backbeats usually are, they're near two and four, they, they imply a backbeat. They have the same feeling. They create the same feeling as a backbeat. And you might listen to this groove and groove along and not register that there aren't any snares on two and four. So. Let me just play the groove again a little slower so we can hear where these are, and then we're going to talk about them in a little greater detail here. One, two, and here we go. So the first snare drum, like I said, is on the end of two. And then the second backbeat is on the E of four, but you can't really think of it by itself on the E of four. Because what's happening is it's part of a figure that's happening with the kick drum. Doom, doom, ska. Do, do, get to doom, doom, ska. Do, do, get to doom, doom, ska. Do, do, get to doom, doom, ska. Right, so I guess, counter to what I was just saying, the first backbeat fills the role of a backbeat. Boom, ka, marks the time, big time. The second snare accent operates less like a backbeat and more like just a melodic figure. Do do get do doom. It's almost like you could play all those notes on the kick drum, do 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 boom, if you could play them fast enough, and you wouldn't really change much significant about the groove. But that first backbeat, you kind of have to play it on the snare, otherwise it changes things significantly. So this last part of the groove here, do do get to boom, two, three, do do get to doom, requires a little bit of fast kick drum stuff. But the way to think about that snare drum is that it's part of that melodic moment there. One, two, So the snare drums, they do kind of function in different ways, but they're both displaced and they're both consistently displaced. Part of the reason they need to stay, everything needs to stay where, where it is, is because there's a lot of syncopation going on and people are playing different notes all the time and it's fast uh, and basically I can, I'm not going to add a single note or fill to this section ever. And when I have tried, it is just so obviously the wrong thing. right? In order for those fast words that Joanna is singing to come through, we have to be as out of the way as possible. And when we are playing as sort of strange and crazy a thing as this groove, the way to stay out of the way is to repeat it verbatim every time. Because if we start adding sort of bells and whistles and extra fills and stuff, it's going to become chaos immediately. But anyways. We've got that groove going, and then all that's left is to add ghost notes. And in this case, I'm not doing anything too interesting ghost notes, but with ghost notes besides just adding most of them. So one approach to ghost notes is to add all of the 16th notes that aren't already covered. Right, so in this case, if we have... You can hear that they sort of pick up, turn on, and turn off. So we go, they're off, dum dum, scat, and then they turn on, tsk, 
<laughs> the first half and the second half of the groove, and it creates this sort of push pull. Boom, boom, scat. Do do get do 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 scat. Do 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 boom, boom, scat. Anyways, that's what the ghost notes are doing. So if we review sort of where we came to from standard groove rules, we've got the hi hat is keeping time like it tends to do. It's playing quarter notes with an open hi hat on two. The backbeat is still serving the purpose of a backbeat, but that backbeat is on the end of two. And then it's debatable whether the E of four is functioning like a backbeat or part of the melody. The kick drum is to a large degree still just playing the most important melodic stuff. Dum dum ka do 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 ska. The kick drum's kind of doing its thing, but it's just a unique melody. And then ghost notes are doing kind of a ghost notey thing, kind of a normal ghost notey thing. So the thing that's most unique and the thing that I want to highlight the most in this video is the backbeats, that these displaced snares are creative options that totally make the groove unique, but that are really not that, not that wild of a thing in terms of the, the technical, of technically what's going on or the difficulty of playing them. So that's the groove. Um, now let's think for a sec before I play this with the section and we move on to the next section. Let's think for a section, but there's, a, there's a, a big creative lesson sort of lurking in the background here. And it becomes clear when we think about the guitar parts that Asher and Jet are playing rhythmically compared to the melody of this drum groove. Because when he first sent it, I thought, I don't know if this works. Like, then I'm going to have to change what I'm playing because the notes he's playing are like everywhere except what I'm playing. And I feel like we need to link up because you have this idea. It's like, it's a tight funk song, which means we got to be playing the same riff, you know? But if you think about it, like I said, he's playing E's, Us for an entire measure over the bar line to the next E. I'm playing a lot of downbeats, right? Doom, doom, scat. Doom, doom, scat. Do, do, get to boom. Do, do, get to boom. Even the last figure accents the strong downbeats. Dum dum scat, go to get to boom boom. I don't really hit, I don't really accent with any force and upbeat until the ah of four. Dum dum scat, to do get to boom. And then, and this is what really, when I heard it, I was like, that uh, one of us needs to change something. I play, he plays the E of one as the last note. Dum bum dum bum dum bum dum bum bum. I play the end of one. I play one sixteenth note later, and this could be a mistake. That could be an avoid note, right, for me. It almost sounds like we just weren't listening to each other. But what's crazy is it didn't take long for this all to make perfect sense. And the lesson that's really important creatively, you know, if you play along with music or you play along with other people, is that there is a lot of room to stretch in terms of playing contradictory things or contrapuntal things or just different parts that don't line up rhythmically. Because if you would have asked me, would this sound good, like, you know, conceptually, I'd be like, probably not. But what makes it work is, A, stylistically, we are playing things in the same way, right? Tight, uh, wait, tight sounds and fast and syncopated. But furthermore, what makes something like this work is, A, the conviction that's behind it, and B, the repetition of it. So if we were jamming sort of random stuff and this came out in one moment as a fill, it probably would be like, okay, it was a little awkward. But if we then take the awkward thing and repeat it, and it is, now we've just decided, this is the groove. It doesn't take more than one or two measures for it to just become normal, right? This is what's going on. And the other thing that's really interesting and useful to think about is that the listener doesn't hear a drum groove and a guitar part as two separate things side by side and compare them. 
what they are confronted by, like the experience of listening, is the rhythm of the band as a whole. Right? So if I play downbeats and Asher and Jed play upbeats between them, what is received is all those notes, right? And there might be emphasis on one or the other, but it's this composite rhythm that ultimately gets delivered to the listener. And if you keep this in mind, you can create, you can be aware of the composite rhythm that's being created by three people in a room playing things that don't overlap completely, right? So anyways, this is a really interesting just study in, because it, it, it's so common and it's so tempting to think we have to play together. We have to lock up on the rhythm. And that can be a really sort of one-dimensional, boring session, actually, because you're always just like, it, it's, then it depends, the creativity of music depends on how interesting of a rhythm you can think of and all play. But if you choose not to line up, and this is a creative decision that's always there for you, and you can do that in degrees, of course, then way more possibilities sort of multiply before your eyes. Anyways, I find this kind of thing very interesting. Um, and what ends up is, you know, in, our, in my opinion, this is one of the most unique grooves on the album. And it really shouldn't work in, in, in theory, but it also, in theory, in deeper theory, it should. So anyways, that is the verse. I'll just play the end of it, and then let's listen to the pre-chorus, chorus, post-chorus, post -chorus, sort of like it's very short. Um, and that'll basically be the content of the song. But basically, uh, I want to pay attention to what the backbeats continue to do because they sort of continue to change. Here we go. So, in terms of uh, tension and release, or creating push and pull contrast, one version of doing this is doing what I just described, playing different uh, interactive things that interact with each other, and then in the next section, playing things together. Right? So this is one of the spectrums, the continuums creatively, that you can move along as a, a duo or a trio or a larger band moving. How lined up are we? Are we knocking out this riff together? Or is everyone playing a sort of different part that contributes to the composite rhythm? When we switch to this, I guess it's the chorus. I kind of actually forget like what we called what here. I think it's the chorus. I just start playing one, two, three, boom. boom. Right, so uh, <laughs> all the uhs. One, a uh, two, a uh, three, a uh, four, a uh, one. Ah, two, ah, ah, four, ah, eighth notes. We're back to like standard groove stuff. Back beats on two and four, up beats on the left foot. Everything's feeling really normal again, right? This is another continuum that you can be playing along with. Normal versus, uh, uh, you know, not normal, weird stuff. <laughs> Breaking the rules, following the rules, right? And we've just, in from one section to the next, gone from breaking the rules to following the rules. And in the, at the same time, gone from uh, not playing the same rhythm, like playing, offering a composite rhythm, to playing basically the same rhythm, right? So we're all going, doom, got it, boom, got it, boom, bada, boom. We're all doing that, and suddenly it feels very different and locked in. There's not much to talk about in that section. It just, the two and four comes back, reestablish normalcy, and there we are. And then it goes to the post-chorus, which is just kind of an extension of this vibe. But this is where uh, the other guys, I think, are doing pretty much a similar or same thing. And really the main thing that changes again is these backbeats, so again. And this time they really do focus as both as backbeats, alternate backbeats. The first backbeat is doom, ka, ka. A double backbeat on the two and, one, two and, one, two and. And then the second backbeat, again, is the E of four. So boom, ka, ka, do, ka, doom, ka, ka. Boom. And this idea actually was planted in my head by some Anderson Pack song. I don't remember exactly what it was, but there's some song where this groove's really hard, and I've listened to it a million times. And then after a million, on the millionth and first time, I was like, 
Oh, the backbeat's like on the E, actually, in this, at the second half of the beat. <laughs> That's planted in my head, and I was just messing around with the idea. Um, and there we were. So let me just play this again, uh, and you'll hear these backbeat changes, and you'll hear us as a band sync up uh, rhythmically and musically, and you'll hear the effect that it creates. I'll do the play-along version so that... Which is, by the way, on my website, jpbuvetmethod.com. You can go play along right now. Here we go. Not as long to pace it, and we don't speak much about it. You're more than often absent. We don't have to be stagnant. We could choose to work around this. Either you're on your own, or we start over. I won't go so long. I want you to choose your poison. Pour yourself a glass, then you come right. So the other, the other couple things that happen there that are musically worth mentioning is I switch from eighth notes here, ding, 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 to that post, into that post chorus, go ding, da-da-ding, da-da-ding, da-da-ding. Adds a teeny bit of forward motion and energy. And with the same goal, instead of playing upbeats, boom, ch-ka, ch boom, ch -ka, I switch this to eighth notes. Ch -ch 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 -ch. So the back beats change, the speed here changes, the rate sort of changes, the rate doubles here. And the idea is, okay, the vocals dropped out, so that brings the energy down a little. And everyone's kind of playing similar things that they just were, so let me try to elevate the energy a little bit so it feels like it's still moving forward and cruising through this last section, because otherwise it could feel like it kind of dies out. So to play just by itself those two grooves, you can notice all of those subtle things change, um, and just, again, notice the, the change in energy that it creates. Three, one, two, three. I gotta do the double back beats. Three. And then we are back into the verse groove. And honestly, uh, the verse, the chorus, and the post-chorus repeat. There's a bridge where I just kind of play a funk groove, um, and then it goes back to the chorus and, and like sort of big outro, and we just kind of rock out over it. And part of uh, the last musical you know, idea that's worth mentioning here, as you listen to this recording, which is out wherever you listen to music, and think about, again, the musical decisions that are going into it, the other thing that you'll hear throughout this entire album with Joanna is a lot of restraint compared to some of the other stuff that the Japes have put out. The album before this was The Book of Japes. That was basically a contemporary jazz record with tons of improv. There weren't, usually there weren't parts. There were very few parts that needed to be played verbatim. Whereas I just described an entire song that really needs to be played verbatim in order to work and be effective. Whereas the Book of Japes, in order for that to be effective, there can't be parts. right? So the musical intention, the goal, the genre, all of these things matter. And what you're going to hear in this album with Joanna, which is called Matters of Life and Death, part one, there's part two as well, um, is a lot more parts. Right? It's composition focused. It's focused on the song and supporting the songwriting, the lyrics, and Joanna. We have moments to shine. But it's quite a different um, uh, uh, intention that we're bringing to the music and really just fun in a different way. So you hear that a lot. And the reason I'm bringing it up now is that in Another Dose, this song, the parts are really set. And we don't open up and really start kind of going in a little bit till the, till the last you know, chorus and outro. And I think it has a really powerful effect, actually. And we've played this song live, and it feels that way live that when, you know, we're like delivering these high energy parts, but we're not like, you know, f getting flashy and throwing some crazy stuff in. So if you save the crazy stuff, you know, for the fourth minute in a four and a half minute song or whatever this is, 
you you are creating the opportunity to really create a moment in the show. And this is, again, comes back to a lot of those basic creative tools. Uh, tension and release, the push and pull, the contrast. If it's crazy the whole time, if I'm throwing in really cool, powerful fills the whole time, none of them are really going to be impactful. But if I play the song how it's supposed to be played, and then at the fourth minute, you get the fill. Like, you get some big moments. That is going to just, like, contribute to this feeling that there is an arc musically that just needed to happen. And this a feeling of a rival point towards the end uh, can be really exciting. And it can be, you know, what I like to call a moment. And to a large degree, I think the art of putting on a live show is creating these moments. There's a million ways to create them, and sometimes you don't even know that you're doing it. But you know what I'm talking about when you're at a show and like you get that the chills. Or there's, you know, the 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 band sort of explodes in its energy and you find yourself almost like fucking headbanging with them without even knowing. Like the music is animating you in a way that you are not, it's pre-conscious. Those are moments. And if you can create those in the show, you're really, you're really creating an experience for people there that is truly mystical. I mean, this is a magical thing because no one can really put a finger on why this combination of whatever happened created this thing. And no one's going to be able to fully explain what that felt like to the individual or why it was effective. Now, that's a big deal. Now, anyways, in this song, you know, not that we're succeeding every time in doing that, but we save the big moments, at least I do, for the end, hoping that it really like creates a moment. So anyways, uh, other than that, I'm going to play through the song. I have the play along. And like I said, this, this song breakdown and the drumless track for this and the drumless track for all of this album and all of the Childish Jape Salamander album, those are on my website, jpbuffetmethod.com. There also happens to be a lot of courses that really effectively teach you how to find freedom on the drums. It's kind of the only place online where it, it teaches fundamentals, of course, but everything pushes toward the goal of improvisational freedom. Um, so, that sounds like something you're into, that you want to dabble with, check it out. But in the meantime, here is another dose, Childish Japes with Joanna Teeters, and uh, I'm going to play what I just described. And I'm going to really kind of stick to my guns and play this how we would play it live and save that juicy sauce for the end. All right, thanks for watching. Hope you're having a great day. Here's another dose. It started out slowly. Hint of a slip in your story that nobody knows. Then you 